Do you work across Australia's wealth management sector and are seeking to supercharge your business and career? Join us at the most important event of the year, the Australian Wealth Management Summit 2024, coming to the Star, Sydney in May. Senator Jane Hume, Shane Oliver, Cassandra Crowe and Alicia Gregory will be keynoting the event as they dive into the intricate landscape of domestic and global economic affairs and set the stage for transformative change in wealth management. Learn from industry trailblazers as they explore opportunities and challenges in the wealth management industry, equipping you with the knowledge to navigate the complex marketplace. Visit AustralianWealthManagementSummit.com.au today to secure your ticket. This is a Momentum Media production. The SMSF Advisor Show. Your expert insights into the biggest things shaping the SMSF advice industry. Hello and welcome to the SMSF Advisor Show. I'm your host, Keith Ford, joined by Aaron Dunn from Smarter SMSF. Uh, hello and welcome to the show, Aaron. Great to be here again, Keith. How are you? I'm doing very well. We're gearing up for the SMSF Association National Conference next week, but we've got an episode in today to keep their spirits up before they're, they're <laughs> heading to the conference or before they um, join virtually. Absolutely. And we'll both be there. Most we importantly. will both be there. One of the rare instances we'll be recording some podcasts in person. Absolutely. Well, as is always the way, let's kick things off, Keith, with uh, what's making news. Yes. Yeah, so the first thing that we're going to talk about today, the annual SMSF statistics have hit from the ATO. Probably not super surprising to most people, but the sector has actually continued to grow. It's been on a bit of a growth trajectory in recent times. So the growth is not super surprising. Essentially, the top line figures are that there's over 610,000 SMSFs holding about $876 billion in assets. So, you know, not a small amount of money. And among those 610,000 SMSFs, there's 1.1 million members. All these figures are kind of as at 30th of June, 2023. So any changes that have happened in the, you know, six to eight months since that, not included in the annual reporting, but that's where we are at the moment. What are your thoughts on some of these numbers, Aaron? Yeah. So the ATO each year publish their statistical summary. So we do get our quarterly data, but then the ATO will publish once we've gone through that completed cycle of the year. So this, this data is in essence for the 2021-2022 financial year, but does then also look at registrations and so forth, as you highlighted through to the 30th of June, 2023. Real credit, I think, to the ATO in terms of this report, because each year we get deeper and deeper insights to what is actually happening within the SMSF sector. So one of the things, for example, here is that 65% of SMSFs that have been established for more than 10 years, where you know these sort of things we, even five years ago, you know, we didn't really understand the stickiness of you know how long someone might actually have a self-managed fund for. And you know, we can see that now the median age of someone coming into the SMSF sector is 46 and the average age of someone 62. So we have spoken about it with some of the quarterly statistics that we've seen in recent times and spoken about on this show, but it does highlight the diversity of membership. So yes, there's 1.1 million members, but we have you know, in essence, we've got miners sitting in the industry, you know, very young members that can't be trustees at that point in time, but we've got a much older demographic and the ATO has recognised that even in their data by, you know, splitting it out beyond 85, whereas historically they only used to split it out beyond 75 years of age. So a lot of, I would be saying to practitioners generally is, is take the time to try and look at, observe some of the data and what it means, because it actually starts to highlight 
some important issues and what some of the, I guess, trends are in, in certain areas and what you might be doing and can benchmark against what is happening in the marketplace more generally. It not only looks at the trustee market, the member market, but it also looks at service providers and the fact that you know we've got the audit profession here and the and the number of audits that are being done and then the number of tax agents and the you know the average numbers of audits and and tax returns that are being prepared. So all these things you could literally just sit here and talk for an entire show and breaking down those numbers. But there are a number of these things that I see as really valuable going back in to the way in which people are operating their own SMSF, but then how professionals are servicing that market as well. Absolutely. And, it, you know, you can look into what the percentage of assets that are held in different investment types, you know, how much are listed shares, how much are property, all of that kind of stuff, how much are in unlisted trusts and everything along those lines. So there's a lot to kind of dig your teeth into if you want to have a have a look through the numbers and really figure it out. Yeah, and a really good example of this is, yeah, there's been a lot of discussion about the benefits of corporate trustees. So that number has continued to grow and it's now up to about 68%. But when you look at it in the context of brand new establishments, it's nearly 85% of all new funds now have a corporate trustee in place. So the education that goes on within the industry over a period of time, then starts to get recognized and you see the outcomes of what that education does through the statistical data analysis that the ATO undertakes on an annual basis. Absolutely. There's a lot of numbers there for people to have a look at, um, way more than we can kind of just lay out in podcast form. It's not the best way to deal with a bunch of figures being Stats, thrown at you. Yes, it's right. much better to just see them written out if you are are a fan of Excel sheets, you can probably find it on there. Uh, there's an yep. Excel and sheet. And turn them into graphs from if the you ATO. want to. <laughs> That's it. If you like the graphs, the visual learning, go that way. Um, <laughs> someone who's better at Excel than me can do that. <laughs> so on to the next subject that we're going to talk about, retirement income covenant. Everyone loves talking about that. Um, no one's ever found that controversial. Um, the Institute of Financial Professionals Australia, the IFPA, they, for instance, have called for the government to exclude SMSFs from the RIC. That was in their submission to Treasury to do with the retirement phase of super consultation that's going on on the back of a discussion paper. Long story short, they want to make sure that SMSFs do not get included into the um, retirement income covenant. What are your thoughts there? And I guess a bit more broadly on the RIC, Aaron. Yeah, so clearly... The view here is is SMSFs have a far more compliance-based approach, whereas we look at APRA funds and they have a far more prudential regulatory approach. And the framing of the retirement income covenant so far, to what we understand, clearly has a far more prudential overlay to it. And in some respects, which is why we did see SMSFs excluded, is we'd be trying to fit a round um, peg in a square hole. So from that point of view, it becomes more difficult to try and get this right. And, and there, there are some concerns about the role that different providers might have to overlay in, whether there's some duplication in crossover with the retirement income strategy compared to what we've got the investment strategy and so forth. So at this point in time, if you looked at it to where it is right now, it is not necessarily fit for purpose for SMSFs. And, and that is the position at currently that that does make sense. But, and I, and I say this as but because I've taken the view that there are elements within this that do make a lot of sense for the SMSF sector. And they did get highlighted previously about succession and about the right times to exit and, and wind up. So, and the ATO have really latched onto some of that stuff when you look at the literature that they've provided even in setting up an SMSF, they talk about you know getting in place the exit plan. Have you got enduring powers of attorney and things in place? So there are elements to this that are actually quite good. So therefore, and I know the SMSF Association has also flagged the fact that we just need to, rather than just simply shutting the door on this stuff, let's take an open mind to what the government might be trying to do and we will see innovation happen within the APRA sector 
And therefore, is there any opportunities for the SMSF segment to try and capitalize on that as well? So I do personally take a slightly more open-minded approach at this stage. I, you know, my view is, is I could see investment strategies, some specific stuff that could encapsulate a better covenant that deals with retirement income and investment strategy requirements more specific to SMSFs rather than trying to bolt something in at an APRA fund that has to also play out in a self-managed fund. But this is the opportune time to have some discussion around that stuff. We know the government has an appetite to create different sets of rules for SMSFs and APRA funds. There's a bit of tongue-in-cheek there with the NALI, NALI rules. But, you know, again, here's here's an opportunity to at least have some discussion about it before you formalise an opinion to really take forward for the industry. Yeah, you certainly, because the difference in structure of a APRA fund and an SMSF, it's so different. You definitely don't just want wholesale APRA gets put into SMSFs. That would not be good for anyone. But as you mentioned, Peter Burgess, CEO of the SMSF Association, friend of the pod, he's you know basically pointing out that there's been a lot of change within the APRA to, to the legislation governing APRA funds. And it's been designed to improve the system by protecting member benefits and enhancing their outcomes bypass the SMSF sector, but the question is basically, is this all about to change? And if so, how? That's paraphrasing what Peter was saying, but basically there's been improvements that have come from these legislative um, changes in the APRA section, such as you know performance benchmarking, statutory reporting, all of this kind of stuff that has actually benefited members. So when it comes to the changes that are maybe being suggested for the SMSF sector, Maybe just keep a little bit of an open mind. Don't just reject everything yeah. out of hand and, you know, just yeah. try and see where the positives could be for the sector, I guess. Yeah, you don't, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, basically. So if there is some good in there, let's try and work out what that is and and how it might have a positive impact on the, on the sector going forward. So That's right. And, yep. you know, I'm sure many people within the APRA sector of the um, industry were probably anti some of those changes. And, you know, sometimes the people within it uh, don't see where those positives are going to come down the line. But, you know, sometimes the government doesn't see where the problems are going to come down the line. So it goes both ways. Yeah, correct. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And we only saw, I mean, ASIC, ASIC did a report late last year into the implementation of the retirement income covenant across APRA funds. And I think, you know, the response and the outcomes of that were quite underwhelming. So it does present an opportunity for the government to revisit it. And therefore, they're rightly also saying, well, yeah, can SMSFs have a role in this piece as well, given that you know we do have 1.1 million members and it will continue to grow as a sector in its own right? Absolutely. Another consultation, um, there are about a million of them ongoing at the moment, a lot within financial services more broadly, not just the uh, super space, a lot within financial advice generally that I'm sure a lot of our listeners will be aware of. Another one of those is to do with the Tax Practitioners Board and the sanctions regime. There was a, a submission to the consultation on that by joint bodies, essentially. It included, you know, SMSF Association, CAANZ, CPA Australia, FAAA, IPA, a couple of others in there. That's how many there were. I, I can't even name them all. Basically looking at the, the sanctions and saying that it needs to be robust to deter misconduct. Yeah. And, and ultimately here, again, as you said, this is an opportunity to and collectively, I think, as you rightly sort of started mentioning all those names and didn't I think finish. I missed like four. <laughs> yeah. So, but but again, this, this is a really important piece that when you go to government, the more unified the voice, the stronger the voice becomes. And clearly what they're saying here is that there are some gaps that are of concern in the way that sanctions are available to the Tax Practitioners Board. I think in particular, it focused on sort of mid-range sanctions and so forth, and the fact that the TPB lacks interim powers that would allow it to respond more swiftly to, you know, curtail things of a serious manner or that could you know, be quite harmful. So unregistered agents, all those sorts of things are, are just some of the examples there. So Again, it just provides a good opportunity for the industry to go, we want to be the standard setters and not have standards set to us. 
And I think the more as an industry we can try and develop the standard setting that is acceptable to the community and, and government, the better the system's going to be rather than trying to have standards set and then trying to wrap things back up into it, you know, which is kind of what we saw off the back of the Hain Royal Commission as well. And yet here we are, you know, a few years on now starting to revisit those things because it becomes a lot harder to try and manage in that way. Yeah. And, you know, it even the the submission includes mention of the um Australian Law Reform Commission's report yep. about the Corporations Act, essentially, about financial services legislation. And Essentially, for anyone who's not familiar, that report found that I think it called the system porridge in how convoluted it is. Um, yeah, I'll give you. I'll give you a better one. They called SMSFs misfits. Misfits. There we go. So, so there, there was yeah. a lot of strong language within the um, from a bunch of judges within the ALRC who put together that report. It was a long time coming. I think about four to five years they've been mm. working on it. it. It did not paint a pretty picture for the. Um, Corporations Act as a general instrument. Yep. And basically what the joint bodies are saying in this, to bring it back to the TPB, is essentially they don't want the TASA to get to that point, the Tax Agent Services Act. They don't want it to get to that point that it needs this massive review by the ALRC. So if we're going to embark on reform to the sanction and enforcement powers, do it properly and get it done right this time. And so that you know, when you open up the submission from the joint bodies, there's an entire page that is just association logo, name of the person who contributed from the association and their signature. It's an entire page that it takes yeah. up just to be. So it gives that idea of how unified a voice all of these associations are bringing to try and make sure that they're in some way setting the terms for how this will go, trying to show, you know, we have taken this very seriously. We're all coming in the same direction. This is what we think should happen. Yeah. And as I said before, the, the more that you get the unified voice there, the more that the views of all parties are being considered and, and the ducks actually are lined up. So if you've got ducks lined up, then it should become a much easier path for the government to try and hopefully get an outcome that works for all parties. Absolutely. Right. Well, that's everything from the news section of the podcast today. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about trusts with Matthew Burgess from View Legal. Welcome back, everyone. We're now joined by Matthew Burgess, who's the director at View Legal. We're going to be talking about all things trusts. Welcome to the show, Matthew. G'day, Keith. Thanks for having me on. Not a problem. Um, we had you featured in an article on SMSF Advisor last week in which you talked a lot about trusts and the way that they interplay with a lot of different things within the current environment, things around Div 296 and how it could play into that. But they've been a, a structure for a broad range of Australians, not just the wealthy, though many believe that is the case. Um, the, the use of trusts, it's Back in the spotlight, government, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese notably um, refusing to rule out changes to trusts. Are the government's views outdated that they're, you know, simply there for tax minimization for the wealthy or is it a bit more nuanced than that? Yeah, great question. And I think, I mean, I've heard Aaron say this in recent times that from my perspective and, and maybe you'd say, well, I'm part of the problem because I've been, we do a lot of work in the trust area. But from my perspective, it's a real misnomer to be sort of suggesting that trusts automatically equal tax avoidance or tax planning or that they're automatically only for the wealthy. I think the the history in the modern Australian era is that is, is almost the exact opposite. You know, trusts have been generally used by business owners full stop. You know, all of us can point to many, many examples where business owners are anything but falling into the category of being either high, very high net wealth or, or anything else in between. So it, it is a real... There's a branding issue, I think, for trusts as a whole, and it really is driven around that literature and, and culture, if you like, of people automatically making assumptions about the, the style of person that's using a trust. Yeah, so thinking that, uh, sort of thinking through that a little bit further, the fact that, yes, there are some tax benefits to trust, but, I mean, by and large, when we think about trust structures, we do think about small businesses and then we do have a correlation, obviously, to SMSFs as well. You know, 
some of the other key areas from a trust point of view as to why people go down that path. Yeah, absolutely, Aaron. And I think, I mean, it was probably touched on in that article, but it's worth repeating. The reality from our perspective, and, and maybe we're in some sort of bubble where there's unicorns and rainbows and we, we don't yeah. really realise what's going on, but with that disclaimer, I mean, the reality for most people, the vast majority, in fact, I'd say almost all people, is that tax is always a consideration and it would be misleading to suggest that it isn't, but it it is by far and away outweighed by a high range of other things that are infinitely more important than tax. So you you know, the old catch cry that you should never let the tax tail wag the dog. I think all advisors in this area absolutely believe that to be true. And, and most customers or clients that are taking advice are absolutely of the same opinion, Aaron. So, yeah, whether it's asset protection at a base level, whether it's ongoing flexibility, whether it's beginning with the end in mind, you know, making sure that you've actually got a succession plan that's going to work, they're, they're the you know, if you're looking for two or three key drivers for people getting into trust, it'll be those three, and tax would be a long fourth. Yeah, and, and that hasn't, as I think, as you said before, that hasn't really changed over time. So trusts are not something that have just come onto the radar, even in Australia recently. You know, they've been here a long time, and they've been overseas a hell of a lot longer. So those principles have been one and the same for much longer than we've been on this planet. Yeah, and I think about I agree with you strongly, and I think if you look at it through those lenses, it probably does explain why they've just remained. Because, you know, this isn't, it's what Keith was touching on, I and mean, this isn't a new thing that the Treasury slash government are wanting to have a shot at trusts, and yet trusts continue to just keep on keeping on. People keep using them, keep having it as a preferred investment structure. And so you need to actually, I think, step back a little bit and ask yourself objectively, well, why is that so? You know, why have they remained a go-to structure? And the reality is exactly what you just said, that mm. the underlying flexibility, the inherent focus on succession planning makes the structure robust and counterintuitively, and, and, and you know, probably the powers that be don't want to hear this, I, I think that my sense of things is no matter how hard they try to attack them from a tax perspective, it will actually further entrench people's desire to be using trusts. Because it's one of the key advantages that they retain that flexibility and they retain asset protection and they retain ongoing succession learning. Yeah, and and it's probably fair to say when you logically think through it, I mean, the government, you know, in in their roles, they don't necessarily, a lot of them don't necessarily understand the basis for what the trust might be there for. And what I mean by that is, is they might, you know, some of them have their own trusts, right? But they're there for investment purposes rather than for trading and operating purposes that have other inherent risks and stuff that are all relevant to that process. So the trust landscape is quite nuanced in terms of the way in which people might have a trust in place, which leads me then to this next question, because this is with the Division 296 proposed tax on high balances above the $3 million, quite clearly those that are going to look to restructure are going to contemplate either using an existing trust vehicle or maybe even establishing a trust to deal with it. And, and therefore, my question to you is, is, do you feel that migration will probably occur in that way? Uh, and, and secondly to that, um, could that then potentially be part of the reason that the government's sort of starting to, again, throw out these little landmines around you know, the way in which trusts might actually look at getting taxed? We've almost come full circle, haven't we? Because I, I think yeah. the one word answer to your question is absolutely. And the second order consequence of that answer is that because of how strong our structure trusts are, for all the other reasons we're British trusts from a commercial perspective, and because of what you said at the very, very start, which is this, this idea that suddenly the trust is just evil. You know, trusts are effectively a four letter word from a treasury perspective that they just it just derails very, very quickly. It becomes this irrational discussion yep. because trusts are by definition, you know, if you Google up trusts, the answer is well they're they're evil. They're a force of evil. And therefore it, as you say, it just very quickly derails. And because the things, the indicia or the the items that will have attracted people into the SNSF environment in the first place, and you know, you've been very strong in the marketplace in saying you know, a lot of people are being dragged into super generally, but specifically SNSFs under one regime. Yep. And now we're just being the whole game's being changed on us halfway through the playing time. It, the only other structure that is even remotely 
as useful as an SNSF, including from a tax perspective, is a trust. Mm. And so it's, as you say, anyone that's getting even remotely decent advice is absolutely having to look to trust as, as really the only other palatable solution if they're having to exit an SNSF because of these rule changes. Yeah, and, and again, it comes back to all the elements that you said earlier. So, yes, they're going to arguably be in a a similar, maybe slightly better, maybe worse, and obviously the unique circumstances of everyone's going to be different, but the fact that the trust structure would be in play there for you know potentially a quantum of assets moving from super into non-super means that you're starting to look at the succession post that individual. And the view has always been, well, this is a problem that's actually going to sort themselves out in the future because this generation of individual will die and all the money's got to come out of super anyway. But the reality is, is a lot of these people that are getting the advice right now will be actually thinking not just what happens today, but how are we going to be looking at this in five years, 10 years, 20 years time when I'm no longer here? I totally agree with you. I think the big thing, and I hadn't actually thought of it until I was listening to you speak then, Aaron, is that, so I've just walked out of a meeting today, 42 years old, about a million bucks in an SNSF. Like, he is the kind of person that should be doubling down. He's got a young family, should be doubling down in SNSF. Guess what he's doing? He's turning the tap off. He's not even going to do his minimum contributions. Yep. And he's putting everything he was otherwise going to put into an SMSF into a trust because he just says, I've got, he said, I'm not that old, mm. but I've lost count of the number of radical changes that have made to the SMSF rules since I started putting, since I said I'm a fund. Yep. So he, even though he's nowhere near the $3 million cap and, and it may take him a number of years to get there, he's actually already made the decision that SMSFs are not for him because there's a complete lack of trust in, in the whole regime. And so that's, you know, the hidden consequence, I think, because it's quite easy for people to call out the air quotes rich people that have yeah. already got the three million, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is that it's actually having a material impact on people's decisions right now that, that you know, the propaganda is telling yeah. us, oh, well, no, it's not affecting anything else in some of the rich people. Well, no, it's not. Here's an example from today where someone's actually opting out of the SMS environment because of the, the fact that they have no trust at all and what it's going to look like over the next 10 to 15 years. Yeah, and it's, it's quite fascinating when you say that because it goes entirely against the grain of what they're trying to achieve in the objective of super, which is actually giving Correct. enough aspiration for people to be able to save and, and live a dignified retirement. So for someone like that, their concept of a dignified retirement will now actually contemplate you know, utilising a, a multitude of structures to be able to achieve that. Historically, we've seen a lot of people go through and in particular, the baby boomers have gone through and accumulated through super and used that as the vehicle. And But I think we're going to see more and more and more a greater level of diversification across structures for them to get to where they want to get to. Oh, I entirely agree. And it was quite stark for me sitting through this thing today because also, I, I hadn't, I've got to say, I hadn't really stopped to think about what was the impact for people that were clearly not going to be caught by it on day one? Yep. And, and you know, what, what did they say? It's N1. <laughs> I've got a, a test group of one. But, you know, it was hard to argue with it. Like, I, I certainly didn't have an argument to suggest why he should be still trying to get into an SMSF or still trying to invest into his SMSF because he said, well, from a succession planning perspective and from a tax planning perspective and, and from a flexibility perspective, like, why would he be, be wanting to lock anything up? For another mm-hmm. 20 odd years, given the radical changes that he's seen in the last handful of years. It does kind of um it jumps out that, you know, people who go into SMSFs, they are by nature, I guess, willing to put a little bit more effort into their retirement because it's much more involved than just having it sitting in an APRA regulated fund. It seems as though there's a limit on how much they're willing to deal with and everyone's limits probably a little bit different and if there's all these changes it it seems like for that person in particular it's hit that limit where now no it's more hassle than it's worth i'm going to a different option is that the kind of thing that we're probably going to keep seeing my sense and look we're still early days on this but the reality is that you know it's less than 18 months to go until we're into this new world and and there's no sign that any of us are seeing that the rules are going to change in a beneficial way Maybe mm. it even become worse. And I, I think you're exactly right, Keith. And I think 
if you are talking back to Aaron's point, if you are talking about the baby boom and the generation, and they've got the added issue that tax officers now come out, you know, very, very bluntly as to what their position is on fast death tax for SMSF. So in other words, this idea that if you if you've got if you're a baby boomer and you don't have any tax dependence left, then you've you've got the added time bomb. Not only have you got the three million dollar issue, but you've also got the issue that you, you're potentially going to effectively pay a, a death duty if you've got money in there at the date of death as well. So I think the combination of those two issues are very much going to stay on the agenda. And and the reality is, and this is you know, it's part of the reason I think the industry as a whole, but me in particular, I'm not speaking any more widely, are so disheartened with the way this is all playing through is that, you know, tax advantages were just shown, you know, that they were a huge carrot that was put in front of everyone to get into SMSFs. And now, you know, without any fanfare, that they're just so basically just attacking that tax benefit and therefore, as you said, Keith, may, meaning that people really, when you do your old pros and cons list, you know, tax has suddenly gone from being a real pro to, in an SMS set to being a real con. Mm-hmm. And and then when you then go through all the other factors that Aaron's taken us through, we're, we're suddenly back into a situation where we're saying, oh, this is all just too hard. But no trust in the process. Or, or I do know, as Aaron said, the trust has been around for as long as Australia's been around, and they actually seem to get stronger the more the regulatory authorities try to attack them. Yeah, and we can probably overlay all that, which we don't have time for today, but the fact that we've got marginal tax rates that are adjusting at that lower end. So, you know, there will become points in time from in particular that death benefits issue that you flagged before where you go, well, look, 16% at a marginal rate versus 15% in the fund, if I can actually manage that risk and pay a 1% penalty for that, that might be a better outcome too. So, yes, I think there's a lot of levers here that advisors need to be thinking about. And maybe the final question here, um, you know, what do you think this actually all means for advisors and, and you know, the conversations that advisors should be having and, and the conversation you're actually having with advisors around some of this stuff? Yeah, we, you, you probably heard me say this before. Our business plan, which we're happy to share with others, it seems to be working pretty well, well as uh, one word, and that one word is trusts. And the advantage of that for anyone that's even got a passing interest in SMSFs is what is an SMSF? Yep. Well, it's, it's a simply a form of trust. Yep. So I think from, you know, if you're looking at it purely, if you're an absolute purist in terms of SMSF advice, then I, I would still argue that this is still well within your realm. SMSFs aren't going to disappear. No. But their utility are absolutely in the spotlight. And I think that as long as you've got an open mind about how you deliver your advice in this space, you know, counterintuitively, given all the things we've discussed, I mean, this is a it's an absolute dream for any advisor in this area. None of us are going to be out of a job anytime soon. No, absolutely not. <laughs> it's now, you know, is that actually good for the productivity and advancement of our country? Well, well, that's a separate question. But in the meantime, you know, be, what, what these changes do. And the constant white noise, even if they don't actually bring in any changes to the trust regime, but the constant white noise around it is that people are just going to be even more attached to making sure that they're getting quality advice. Absolutely. And do you have any other kind of final thoughts to cap us off with um, around the the trust issue? Well, as Aaron said, we could divide a whole number of programs for this, so I don't want to open up <laughs> further concerns when, I, when it's such a busy time of the year for everyone. The one thing I would flag is that, and I know this has been a real issue in the industry for other reasons, but I, there is a comp- an everyday boring compliance style issue that pe- probably people do need to be aware of, and that is in relation to actually having the original source documents for whatever structure you're going to use. Now, you know there are generally ways to manage that with an SMSF, that is not the case with trusts. You know, it's a real issue. If you don't have the wet signed original trust instrument, it, it's a huge issue. And we're seeing from a bank and know your client perspective that that has become an enormous problem for everyone in the trust world. So I just encourage people that, you know, it's all very well to say we're all going to be busy and we've got all this advice we're going to do to help people. But the in the trust space, those basic compliance issues are fundamental and unavoidable. Mm-hmm. And and I guess equally is the case. Uh, here, Matthew, as well, where the the older the trust, uh, the more difficult it might become to find, and and the more difficult that it might be to try and fix 
uh, in in certain positions as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and as you say, then you, again, you've got this second and third order consequence stuff. So it, you know, let's just to say you, you haven't lost the trust, but unlike SMSFs, there's a hard end date for well, other than in South Australia, but everywhere else, there's a hard end date for the trust, and quite often that end date will be a lot earlier than what you might have otherwise assumed. So traditionally, eighty years, but it can often be quite a lot less than that. Yep. And so, that, again, these are all issues that, as an industry, we're just going to have to be in front of the game and, and helping people manage them. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Matthew. It was great having you on the show. Likewise. Great to speak with you both. Thank you. All right. We're going to take another quick break now. We'll be back shortly. Okay, we're back now, just myself and Aaron. Um, Aaron, what jumped out to you from our conversation with Matthew there? Uh, I think you know, the reality is, is to me, it's quite clear that trusts are going to have, but will continue to play a really important role in um, not only the management of wealth, but the development of wealth um, going forward. And you know, things like Division 296 is yet another example of where we're going to have to see adjustments made to balances that are held in super and outside super and so forth. And the reality of that is, is that the trust structures are the ones that people will look to. And yep, there might be some utilization of tax benefits there, but I agree entirely with what Matthew was saying in there is, is that they are so much more than that. And tax in probably 90 out of a hundred cases, isn't going to be the primary driver as to why it's actually going to sit there. And I think that's the important piece that the government doesn't necessarily understand. And and we get to this time of year every year. If we go back in history and we look at February, right, we will see stuff in the media all the time about things that the government just, they just throw the fishing rod out there and, you know, just see what they can hook in. And so these concepts that the government have been talking about, you know, do they put a tax rate in? And these are not things that have been new. And therefore, this is why we've seen trusts in Australia for a long time and why we've seen trusts utilised all around the world since probably the 12, 13 or 1400s or whatever. It might even be earlier. Right. So you reckon just a bit of just a bit of fishing to get some ideas from the government there, just pre-budget? Yeah, I think, <laughs> I mean, it's it's not an uncommon scenario. So the, you know, it's kind of the usual suspects turn up, capital gains tax, negative gearing taxing of trusts. <laughs> Absolutely. Already, they're, they're already, they're, they've already had the crack at superannuation, so they're not going to go there again. Can't do that one. You're already underway. So, you know, I, I think I, they were saying, you know, capital gains, negative gearing, are kind of they're off the table, I think I saw. But then, as we discussed uh, last episode, just because they've said that doesn't really mean that's how it's going to play out. Oh, yes. Yes. Very, <laughs> very true. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, yes, that is very true. Um well, as is always the way, if anyone has any suggestions on speakers, uh, topics and the like, how can they get in contact with us? That's it. Editor at smsfadvisoronline.com.au and hit us up with anything you've got. Uh, well, next week, well, the, our next edition, I should say, we're going to be coming live from the SMSF Association Conference. So we absolutely will. We have a number of speakers lined up and it will be in essence, a two-part edition. So we look forward to you joining us for the next edition of the SMSF Advisor Show. Have a great rest of the week and bye for now. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. trapped by rising interest payments escape from mortgage prison with expert refinancing assistance from finney we have helped hundreds of borrowers break free from higher loan repayments by finding a more suitable loan our expert team can quickly assess your situation and if there's a better lender available we'll find it fast don't delay call today speak to a finney mortgage specialist on 02 2444 or visit our website at www.finney.com.au